go ahead our speaker for today to introduce herself in some details and her topic and intention and then go ahead with her presentation. Um, Dr. Rosina Munir, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Dr. Rosina Badr Munir and I work in uh, Los Angeles in a hospital as an ultrasound specialist. Besides this, I'm also an educator and I have uh, trained in multiple workshops, both national and industry in the United Arab Emirates and in Pakistan. And today I'm going to talk about the, um, about the ultrasound disinfection. Let me open my um, presentation. Okay. Uh, our next topic about the training of uh, how to scan will be, uh, inshallah, the next uh, week. But today we are going to talk about the proper PPE, disinfection, doffing of the ultrasound machine. Now, as we all are uh, passing through this pandemic state and day-to-day uh, um, um, -day there is a change in the data and the information, and so the collection of uh, uh, sharing our experiences at this platform is something very really, uh, appreciable. And I also have, uh, after talking at the diff with different physicians who have been using the website ultrasound uh, and after discussion, I also have compiled some of the uh, guidelines where I, I'm sure that you will like it. So we all know that the uh, CT and the X-rays, chest X-rays, uh, these are considered as the modalities of uh, choice and uh, evaluation of the lung. Uh, but in the COVID-19 situation, we have certain uh, uh, challenges, such as uh, the availability. There are a lot of places where there is no uh, CT or the uh, portable chest X-ray. Uh, even if these are available, so then we have another issue, another challenge, which is the um, disinfection. Obviously, if you are using the uh, taking the patient to the uh, CT, so uh, disinfecting the entire unit and then the entire time is something a very very uh, big challenge. So in that situation, uh, the ultrasound is considered to be the best choice, um, especially the uh, uh, because the most of the physicians they have been practicing the backside ultrasound since uh, more than a decade, and they like to do the they like to scan and get innocent answers uh, by the real time scanning. Uh, I'm not against the stethoscope, but uh, this is my experience that those physicians who have been using the bedside uh, exam ultrasound in their uh, practice, especially in the ER and in the intensive care units, uh, they like it very much uh, because uh, ultrasound is highly sensitive and it is very specific. So uh, even in COVID-19 situation, uh, we are using uh, the, those people who are using the um, uh, ultrasound, they are very much benefiting from it. So now, if you look at over here, they, we have a different ultrasound machine. So we have a card-based machine. So this is another unit which is mostly available in the, um, in the ER because it is just a touch screen system, very, very simple. And then most of all, the doctors are using very much the, the handheld units. So the availability of these handheld units, because there are a lot of uh, companies who are producing these handheld size ultrasound machines, uh, so this is uh, very much uh, liked by most of the physicians. Uh, now, if you Pakistan, mostly over there, they, they are using the card the traditional machines. Uh, handheld the machines may be not the other trend that we may start with, uh, but I tried my best in the last my workshop in uh, different uh, hospitals in Pakistan. I tried to introduce into uh, two hospitals and they like it very much. They like the use of handheld machines. So, uh, there are just five guidelines which I made that we find out after talking with different people. So this is the that uh, one number one is the dedicated unit. Uh, so we will explain one by one. Let's go there. Okay. So number one is the dedicated unit. Now it is very common practice even in the U.S. In every hospital, they have a dedicated machine for the ER and for the intensive care. And even in Pakistan, I have seen the uh, like in the reading hospital when I was giving the workshop over there they were planning to buy a machine specifically for their ER. So the dedicated unit is very important when you are going to the uh, COVID uh, unit, if you are planning for the COVID unit. Uh, in the selection of the machine, I will just say that they try to select a machine which is very simple, such as over here, this is the machine. If you have the uh, handheld equipment, that is the best, but in case if you don't have the uh, handheld device, so at least then select a machine which is simple. 
we do not have that much here knobs and you know like buttons over here such as this machine but uh, in places uh, sorry to interrupt uh, can i uh, ask you and request you to maybe adjust your microphone a little bit uh, because your voice is um, uh, breaking up a little bit uh, um, if you on the zoom uh, screen there is a microphone on the bottom and there is an arrow next to it if you click yes. on the arrow and then go to audio settings and just reduce uh -huh. the sensitivity of your microphone a little bit uh, because okay. it goes beyond and then that makes it choppy so just tell me the is input it... volume on microphone just lower the input volume so it stays green oh okay is it better now yeah it's better it's better now yes yes please okay that's good okay thank you so much yeah okay so let's continue um so uh, when you are selecting the machine which you are going to dedicate uh, for your covid 19 so i would just suggest that select the machine which is uh, simple which does not have that if you don't have a handheld device then at least select the machine which is very simple does not have a lot of knobs but in situations where you don't have, or even in Pakistan, if you don't have the machine, very simple one, so the ultimate choice is that you have to select use your own uh, the card-based machine. So in this case, if you are using a card, the traditional machine, so it is better if you can cover the bottom of the card with some sheet. If you don't have a proper plastic sheet, you at least cover it with any linen, cover it with a gown, but at least protect this part, and then because there are a lot of knobs on the control panel, if it is better, it is better if you can cover this control panel with some plastic sheet. Because uh, these are the small knobs and you can, when you, uh, while the time of this, uh, cleaning it, you can miss any of the knobs, so then it is a cause of the spread. So this is, this is the second option if you are using the traditional machine. On uh, the monitor side, uh, if you have a cover, it's fine. If you don't have it, that's fine because it's only one piece and you can clean it very uh, uh, easily. So this is the one that you can perform the property. Okay, let's go. Next slide. Okay. Now that if you don't have anything to cover the machine, but at least cover the probe. Now why to cover the probe? Because this is the part which we come in contact with the patient. So if you have a probe cover, which is the which is a long sheet, so you cover the your transducer and then it covers the entire cable. And also use a small package of uh, jug, which is a disposable one, so it's just a one-time use. In cases, uh, I also have, uh, some of the people also have uh, shared that uh, they don't have the probe cover, and but we have to make uh, the use to say, so either they use the uh, glove with the jug inside and they, they perform the exam with the help of the glove and the transducer, but at least they cover their transducer. So this is one another option also. Uh, this is the, uh, if you see over here, this is the handheld machine. And uh, if you see there that how convenient it is to use these machines for the COVID-19 patients. The entire machine is comes, the transducer is in a small sheet. You can use your tablet or you can use your phone and you can cover it in an end to plastic sheet. And in case when you are performing the exam, even if you're not using any protective sheet, it is just these two units which can be very easily cleaned. So uh, this is the picture, you know, which shows you that, okay, even if you're not using any sheet, but it's easy to clean them afterwards. Now we come to the uh, third part, which is the, uh, like the machine placement. So once you take the machine, ultrasound machine, and you enter into the COVID-19 patient room, so make sure that you make enough place uh, for your machine to put it. And also make sure not to put the machine very close to the patient bed. And your patient should have a mask, uh, especially N95 mask. And another thing that expose your patient properly and the patient should be positioned properly so that you can see the, you can perform the exam accurately. Uh, number four part is that the proper dropping of the machine and disinfection. So once you are done with the exam of the patient, so now the step, now the part is to clean, how to clean it. So it is better to take the machine a little bit away from the uh, patient bedside and clean the, clean the uh, use the uh, standard uh, sandy wipes or uh, candy wipes, whichever is uh, available with your department or your COVID-19 uh, clinic. 
So just uh, use those uh, wipes and clean the machine, each and every part of the machine. Clean it from the handle, the part, if you have a, a um, like a, the, the box over here for the wipes, clean that. It is better if you take some of the wipes and put it on the machine, but even if you are using the box, clean that box. Clean the handle, clean the wire, the pole, the front of the machine, the back of the machine, the lower part. Clean each and every part of the machine, and after that, you can just, uh, when you are exiting, just drop your own PPP and uh, um, just uh, remove it according to your, uh, according to the according to the protocols of your department of your institute. So after that, once you are out of the room, so then you have to clean this whole machine by changing the gloves, new gloves, and then clean the whole machine again. With the, this is all you practice all after you come out of the patient room. You clean it the second time and then put the machine back to the dedicated area so that everybody know that this machine is now clean and it is ready for the next patient to be used. Now the last part is that the scanning time. Minimize your scan duration. Uh, so for that, you can just put the uh, data of the patient into the uh, your uh, into your machine uh, before you enter into the patient room. It is also recommended that if you can set the presets of the exam, uh, that which presets you have to set your machine. So do that part a little bit uh, before entering into the patient room. Uh, another thing is that uh, if the physician is performing the exam, that's fine. But if you are using any other operator, so use the experienced and a reliable operator. Uh, another th thing is that uh, when you make your mind that uh, what you are going to see in your patient when you are inside the room, you are looking for the lung, you are looking for the CVP, you also have to look for the heart. So your exam should be gold oriented. It should be gold directed. You should know that I'm looking for these specific answers in my patients. Uh, another very good uh, um, point which we, um, which I found after a lot of discussing with other people, one is that they don't waste your time when you are staying in the patient room and you are on, on the measurement. Just take the images or take the cine clips and then once you are out of the patient room, you can take the measurements on those images and even if you have a cine, you have recorded the videos or cine loops on the machine, you can also have a uh, second opinion with the other, with the other, with the other person with whom you want to share or you want to take a second opinion. So these are some of the points which I um, just I, I presented it over here. So in summary, I would just say that you must have a dedicated unit, pro perform the proper effective PPE for the machine, and uh, because everybody is talking about your own PPE, that's important, very important, but also for your machine. And then is the placement of the machine into the patient room. After that, after exam is done, then the proper doffing of the machine and the disinfection. And finally is the scanning time. So this is some of the points which I collected and I hope you enjoyed it and you liked it. So thank you so much. And if there's any question, please feel free to ask. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rosina. This was excellent. And this is something that we have not covered too much, the technical aspects of actual patient care, especially with things like that. I think the closest we came was a discussion on the use of tools like stethoscope um, or, or hammers and things like that, but uh, something like expensive equipment like what you use, uh, how to properly take care of it and, and avoid spreading the infection is very, very important. Um, you know, probably also uh, you can uh, use this information and apply it for echocardiograms and other other procedures that you do bedside. So this is very useful. Um, before I go on and invite the panelists to introduce themselves, um, I, I again want to remind our attendees that I encourage you guys to uh, join us as panelists and speaker or recommend speakers to us. Please send us email or messages uh, on people who would want to be speaker or who would you want to see a speaker or want to be a panelist. You can also when you join on a day and you want to be a panelist, you can send us a message or raise your hand and ask for it. Um, and I see Dr. Fizia Harikar has joined. If uh, Waleed can uh, make her a panelist, that'll be great. Waleed, I'm not a co-host today, so I don't have those tools uh, available to me. Um, and then uh, again, if you want to just make a comment uh, and not be a panelist and just make a comment and want microphone, please raise your hand uh, and I will try to get to you 
uh, if time permits, um, if I have the, uh, if the chance to reach out to you. Um, and, you know, let's see if we can uh, ask any questions related to uh, the activity today or, or related to ultrasound in specific or, or any procedures in general, that'll be great. Uh, and we'll try to cover as much as we can. Uh, so uh, let me go to uh, some questions and I see a raised hand. So before I go to my written question, let me just take uh, a question from Dr. Tosif Irfan. Dr. Tosif, uh, please go ahead and unmute yourself, introduce yourself and make your comment or question. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Tosif from Lahore, a family physician. I wanted to know uh, from Dr. Rosina that I thought we were going to talk about the changes seen in COVID-19 um, in the lungs, but aren't we going to do that today? This was very interesting. Thank you for all this as a fiction because this was absolutely new, uh, practicing disinfection on machines like that and taking care of that. And it's very important in these times, but I was also interested in listening to more yeah, maybe we can, yes, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you for that. But actually, we are have a, uh, I am collecting the slides and everything. And that is, uh, that uh, lecture will be on 26th, the Sunday, the next Sunday. Yeah. Okay. Because I want that in a short period of time, I should tell them about all the changes and everything and give you a quick. Oh, I've done that. Tip. But anyhow, as, as let's see how it proceeds. <laughs> with yeah. the question. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Tosif. Uh, you know, we, we, we played it smart and we got two lectures out of Dr. Rosina. <laughs> One on the use of the equipment and second on the findings from the equipment. So it's a, it's a pair of two lectures uh, that we will be doing. Uh, and uh, and uh, I know Dr. Rosina is a real expert on that second topic too. So we're looking forward to that talk. Uh, let me take Dr. Uh, Salim into the discussion. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Salim. Uh, uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself, unmute yourself, introduce yourself and uh, make your comments or question. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Dr. Rosina, it was a very nice presentation. My question is uh, regarding what is the difference in findings in terms of yield when we are using X-ray versus CT scan test in COVID-19 patients? What is the difference between the two so findings? So how sensitivity in terms of picking sensitivity. up the uh, yeah. uh, X-ray, CT, and ultrasound. Right. On the ultrasound, you know, like uh, the you can pick up the changes when it is coming more closer towards the pleural lining, okay? So you can pick those changes very easy and the sensitivity and specificity is 100%. It is a way, I cannot give you the figure, but at least I can say that it is very high sensitivity and specificity as compared to the, the other things are also very important. I know the CT and X-ray. X-rays have a little bit doubtful because sometimes you get a very suboptimal view uh, images because of the patient position. And, uh, you know, patient is supine or it is, uh, uh, so that's why, you know, like a little bit, uh, uh, I have got the views that it is a little bit suboptimal in x-rays when they are taking also on uh, portable. CT is obviously, it's a very highly sensitive and it is very good. But in the COVID-19 patients, you know, specifically if you are talking about the sensitivity and specificity, it is very high. Thank you so much. Very good. So, you know, it looks like that more than comments that uh, many attendees also have questions. So before I continue taking people with their raise hand, let me ask our panelists to quickly go ahead and introduce themselves so we can also get them in the loop for our discussion. So let me invite Dr. Harikar, please uh, uh, introduce yourself. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Sathya Harikar from uh, in this hospital, Karachi, infectious disease specialist. Thank you. So good to have you here. I know how busy you are, so I, it's a pleasure. Uh, Dr. Kaleem Ahmed, please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, Kaleem Ahmed, uh, I am pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine in Maryland, U.S. Thank you, Kaleem Ahmed. And uh, Dr. Mariam Morton, please introduce yourself. I'm Mariam Morton. I'm a cardiologist in Loma Linda, California. Thank you. Uh, very good. So let me go ahead with uh, Dr. Muhammad Naeem. And uh, Dr. Naeem, please uh, introduce yourself and make your uh, comment or question. <clears throat> uh, 
السلام علیکم میں بھی سب کو السلام علیکم میں یہ سوال کرنا چاہتا ہوں کہ آپ نے بڑے اچھے ڈیٹیل میں سارا الٹرا ساؤنڈ کا پروسیجر بتایا اور وہ سارا پی پی ای کو بھی آپ نے بہت اہمیت دی ہے جو آج کل ہم سن رہے ہیں کہ بٹر فرائی آئی کیو یہ جو سمپل اسکوپ اور الٹرا ساؤنڈ بہت ساری اس میں فیسلٹیز دی جا رہی ہیں آیا کہ وہ ٹرو کلیم ہے یا جسٹ وہ مارکیٹنگ کے لیے ایسا کر رہے ہیں دوسری بات یہ ہے کہ ہمیں الٹرا ساؤنڈ پہ کتنی دیر کے بعد جو کووڈ نائنٹین پیشنٹ ہوتا ہے اس میں چینجز مل جاتی ہیں امیجیٹلی تو نہیں ملتی لیکن کب ملتی ہیں یہ آپ کو پتا ہوگا کیونکہ وی آر ناٹ آئی ایم بیسیکلی پرائمری ہیلتھ کے پرائمری ہیلتھ کیئر فزیشین ان دا پیرفری اینڈ ڈوئنگ مائی پریکٹس آلسو ایز جنرل پریکٹیشنر ایز ویل ایز جسٹ ہیلتھ ہیلتھ کیئر فزیشین سمجھ لیں وی آر پرفارمنگ دیئر ایکٹیویٹیز تو بیسیکلی یہی ہے کہ ہمیں تو یہاں پہ ابھی تک بیسکس کا ہی نہیں پتا کہ کب 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 کیا کیا ہوگا تو وی آر ویری مچ اسکیئرڈ اباؤٹ دا چینجز اینڈ دا پیشنٹ اسٹل ناؤ تھینک یو ہاں جی ڈاکٹر محمد آپ نے بہت اچھا کوشچن کیا سب سے پہلے تو یہ ہے کہ آپ نے پوچھا کہ بٹر فلائی کے متعلق تو اب مارکیٹ میں بہت ساری مشینز آئی ہیں بٹر فلائی بہت اچھی مشین ہے لیکن ایک جو ایشو آ جاتا ہے وہ سبسکرپشن کا بیکاز وہ آپ اگر سب خریدیں گے اور پھر سبسکرپشن کریں گے اور آپ کو وہ اینول آپ کو رینیول کرنا پڑتا ہے تو اس میں صرف اس وجہ سے ذرا سا آ جاتی ہے بات کہ آپ کو یو ہیو ٹو بائی اٹ اور پھر اس کا ایک پری سیٹ ہوتا ہے میں جو پرسنل خود یہ یوز کرتی ہوں میں ہل سریان کی سونان یوز کرتی ہوں اینڈ آئی ایم ویری مچ سیٹسفائڈ بیکاز اس میں نہ کوئی سبسکرپشن ہے نہ کچھ ہے بس جسٹ بائی دا یونٹ اینڈ دین یو یو ہیو اے پریکٹس دین یو کین پرفارم اٹ اب آپ کو میں بتاتی ہوں کہ جو ریزولیوشن اس کی بات بتاتی ہوں تو آبویسلی اگر آپ ایک اسٹینڈرڈ بڑا مشین یونٹ لیتا ہے دیتے ہیں اور آپ اس کی ریزولوشن اور اس میں آپ کو زمین آسمان کا فرق نظر آتا ہے بٹ اب جو ابھی جو مشینز آئی ہوئی ہیں یا ایون جو میں یوز کرتی ہوں اس میں ایٹ لیسٹ ریزولوشن بھی بہت کام کیا گیا ہے اور دے آر گڈ مشین یو کین سی یو کین فائنڈ دا یس اینڈ نو آنسر ویدر یور پیشن از اوکے اور یا ویدر یو فائنڈ سم ایب نارمیلٹی بیکاز ہم لوگ بیڈ سائڈ ایگزامس کبھی بھی وہ ٹریڈیشنل یا جو ریگولر روٹین ایگزامس جو ہوتے ہیں جو الٹرا ساؤنڈ ایگزام جو پراپر ڈپارٹمنٹ میں ہوتے ہیں یا اسپیشلسٹ کرتے ہیں وی آر ناٹ ریپلیسنگ دیٹ یو وٹ یو آر ڈوئنگ دی بیڈ سائڈ ایگزامس ہوتے ہیں یس Biological, uh, evaluation. But if they are not stable, then you can take proper management. So this is the basic purpose. Now we have the second question, which is that you have said changes. Now, because COVID-19 is a such situation, that we have so much COVID-19 patients in Pakistan. I'm very worried because I'm getting the treatment from the physicians and may want to uh, even up in the hospital, may when I ask them, the doctors, and when they ask me, so our stakers have also an interaction. اب اس میں اتنا ڈفرینٹ طریقے سے آئے ہیں کہ بعض اوقات جب جو پلور لائننگ ہے وہ جو ہے آئی مین ان نیکسٹ لیکچر میں ہم آپ کو بتائیں گے کہ کیا کیا چینجز دیکھی گئی ہیں اس میں کووڈ نائنٹین کے پیشنٹس میں تو الٹیمیٹلی بات وہی آتی ہے کہ ڈیلی ڈیٹا جو ہے نا وہ اتنا چینج ہوتا ہے تو اس وجہ سے ہم لوگ ڈیلی ہم آپس میں انفارمیشن جس طریقے سے آپ کلینیکل ان کی مینجمنٹ میں آپ دیکھتے ہیں کہ ایک ایک ڈاکٹر ایک اپلائی کرتا ہے یا وٹ ایور یو نو سو ہم لوگ ڈیٹا کلیکٹ کرتے ہیں اینڈ فائنڈ اٹ اینڈ فائنلی اس کو بتاتے ہیں کیونکہ اس میں آ سکتی ہیں اور کیا ہم دیکھتے ہیں بعض اے سمٹومیٹک پیشنٹ بھی ہیں لیکن کف کے ساتھ آئے ہیں تو ہم نے ان میں بھی فائنڈنگ دیکھی ہیں اور بعض میں یہ ہے کہ ہم نے نہیں بھی دیکھی اب ہاؤ کتنی اسپیڈ سے آپ کو چینجز نظر آئیں گے اس کا ابھی تک ہم نے آپ کو کچھ نہیں کہہ سکتے سو بیکاز کوئی ڈیٹا میرے پاس بھی اویلیبل نہیں ہے ایسا جی ڈاکٹر مریم مورٹن یو ہیو اے کامنٹ پلیز ان میوٹ یور سیلف ڈاکٹر مورٹن That was a wonderful overview that you just gave. Or, uh, yes, I bought a cab butterfly over a below use curtain. We do have the ultrasound machine in almost every unit. 
سی سی یو ایم آئی سی یو دیکھیں پلمنری کے آفس میں دیکھیں کارڈیالوجی کے آفس میں دیکھیں وی ڈو ہیو دا پورٹیبل مشین دیٹ آر اویلیبل دیٹ آر بینگ یوز اور دی ہاؤس اسٹاف از آلسو بینگ تھاٹ ہاؤ ٹو یوز دیم اور اٹس اٹس ناٹ دیٹ ہارڈ ٹو یوز جہاں تک اویلیبلٹی کی کنسرن ہے اینڈ واٹ کائنڈ آف مشین ٹو یوز یو کین یوز اینی کائنڈ آف الٹرا ساؤنڈ مشین ایز لانگ ایز دے ہیو دا اپروپریٹ کائنڈ آف پروپ دیٹ آر اٹیچ ٹو ایٹ اگر آپ فیس ڈر پروپ سے آپ کچھ اور کرنا چاہیں تو اٹ مے بی ڈیفیکلٹ لیکن دیر آر پورٹیبل مشین ود آؤٹ کلر دیر پورٹیبل مشین ود آؤٹ ڈاپلر سگنل صرف آپ کو ٹو ڈی اور ایم موڈ کرنے کی اجازت دیتے ہیں بہت سے ہیں کہ جس میں صرف ٹو ڈی ہے and that one you can get in pakistan boston scientific ke hain acusan ke hain johnson and johnson ke hain philips ke hain bahut sare company ke hain that are in the asian market there and once you learn to use it you will find it useful it should not be too hard cost is always a problem and uh, you know that's what we have to live with your portable machines are pretty durable over time Uh, thank you. Does any of the panelists have any comments about ultrasound or procedures in general or equipment cleaning or disinfection? Very good. So, uh, okay, I, had, I see another raised hand before I go on to the questions I have written up. Uh, let me take uh, the speaker. Uh, uh, Please go ahead and unmute yourself, introduce yourself and ask your question or make a comment. Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, sir, I'm Dr. Suhaib, uh, consultant neurologist at Nishtar Medical University, Multan. Uh, sir, it was a very nice talk by Dr. Razina. Uh, let me ask one question from Madam. Uh, that what material should be used for the disinfection of the machine? Actually, uh, آپ جو مشین یوز کر رہے ہیں آپ اس کی جو کمپنی ہے اس سے بیکاز سرٹن مشینز ہیو دیر اون ریکمینڈیڈ مٹیریل ہم جو نارملی یوز کرتے ہیں وچ آئی یوز فار ایوری مشین کلوریکس کے ہیں وہ کلوریکس وائپس ہیں Otherwise, Sani wipes are easily available hai, or even Pakistan may both easily available. Hai. You can use that um, um, COVID-19 ke hawaale se mein yehi kahonge ke aap apne uh, jo machine jaha, jo manufacturer hai, unse aap recommend uh, but even if you have a final project, you can use that aap in the water lake in the normal situation mein, you can use that. But yaha pe jo use ho rahe hai, wo Clorox ke hai. Clorox wipes, you are using that. Um, very good. I think uh, this was also mentioned earlier. Maybe Kalimba has also said this before, that the virus is actually pretty easy to kill. Uh, you know, virus is, um, it can be killed by soap. If you wash it, it, right, yeah. up. it can be killed by almost any alcohol and even heat and UV lights. So, you know, fortunately, the virus is easy to kill. But unfortunately, if you don't use anything, then of course it will not be killed and it will stay there for a few hours to a few days, depending on different surfaces as we talked yesterday. Uh, very good. So I'm, um, I'm gonna go ahead with some of the questions uh, uh, that we have been uh, asked in the past. Um, and so the question have been in terms of uh, uh, you know, reliability of the findings. And in the past we have debated that If you have a clinical presentation, but the test is negative, uh, what you should do. Similarly, we talked about um, changes on imaging, such as CT scan or ultrasound. And if you find changes that are very concerning, suggestive, uh, can they be relied enough to keep testing the patient, even if a negative test is there? Or, or what do you suggest to those who are concerned clinically and your ultrasound have some findings and the test is negative on PCR or something like that? How would you approach those patients or recommend? So it's uh, like those patients who have a finding on the ultrasound. For example, you find the uh, subpleural consolidation. So you, what you can see with your eyes and your real-time scanning, how even if the patient is negative or you, uh, I don't know what the patient has a finding. You know, you find this you can have it because you're looking at it. If you see the uh, patients, uh, like the finding, another finding is that the thickening of the pleura and you can see the other 
some of the artifacts which are called the bee. We will we'll talk about it in the next uh, uh, upcoming uh, lecture. But if you have the bee lines and you have all the positive findings, so you know that the patient had the lungs affected. Now, why the test is coming negative? So that I cannot answer, but at least you can see the findings and you can just treat the patient. And you mentioned earlier you, that you sometimes you, see uh, changes on asymptomatic patients uh, that are concerning for COVID. Do you then, are the physicians then going for uh, PCR testing on those asymptomatic patients if the ultrasound has concerns? I, I think when they, once they find, for example, the very minor pleural consolidation, uh, they are taking the step that they repeat the exams, you know, and they keep, keep the patient under super isolation and they take all those steps. Uh, for the treatment point of view, I don't know about what they are doing, but they, they kept the patients in isolation and they keep monitoring those patients because they find something like, for example, one of the patients we got and they, the patient has a very small subpleural consolidation. The patient does not have any other signs. So, and the test, I don't know about what was the test result, but anyhow, so based on that, they kept the patient in isolation and they keep on following it up. And then obviously the patient turned out to be very symptomatic and positive, yeah. Thank you. Dr. Kabani, do you have a comment? Uh, yes, I was going to say that this uh, issue is, of course, coming up repeatedly about the negative tests uh, uh, in a patient that has typical symptoms. And uh, one factor, I mean, there are several fa reasons for that, as we've all discussed uh, before also, but one factor is also the stage of the disease at which the patient pre presents. If they present early, the nasopharyngeal swabs are very, uh, you know, are most likely going to be positive. But if they are negative, it could be that the, the test wasn't, the reagent wasn't good, or the technique wasn't good, how it was obtained. Uh, so those are the, the factors. So, um, but the patient comes in the intermediate stage or in, in the middle of, of his illness, your oropharyngeal uh, swab may be negative. At that point, you know, the uh, uh, sputum, which of course you don't want to induce, the sputum would be positive. If the patient was intubated, you could do a BAL. And then and later on and all along the disease process, the fecal and the anal swabs are now also being done to to, to if, the, if you are really highly suspicious and you want proof, then that should also be done with that. So it all depends on the stage of the disease. Later in the disease or in the, uh, the uh, oropharyngeal swab may be negative and the virus sort of goes further down and it's only positive in the BAL, which you can't always do. Thank you, Dr. Kabani. So continuing with this theme of... Uh... Uh, disinfection and keeping the devices clean. Uh, there's a very pertinent question asked by uh, Dr. Nosheen Zehra uh, that I want to actually throw it to uh, Kaleem Bhai uh, if you are uh, ready for it. What are the processes for reusing the N95 mask or disinfecting the N95 mask, Kaleem Bhai? So I think it's all uh, depend upon the availability and your institution policies. Uh, in our institution, because uh, we are facing shortage, so we are, uh, after proper fitting, we are giving our healthcare providers N95 mask, and at the end of the day, after they, are, they use it, we return it and they disinfect it, and then they give it back to us. And uh, so far, it's been told that uh, these uh, re and after um, disinfection, uh, the mask, uh, if it is not torn apart or has any kind of other damage because of the moisture or anything else, then it is still effective. So I think uh, so I remember... What method they're using for disinfecting? I personally don't know um, what exactly uh, they are um, uh, using it. Uh, we may have, I may be able to find it and let you know okay. next time. So, so, you know, I have a similar situation in University of Nebraska. Uh, we have a ma 995 mask reuse policy. We're actually asked to write our name on our mask and mm -hmm. give it back to the unit nurse. 
in the process they're using is uv based sterilization so they did a research study to see what uh, method they should use how much exposure uh, and uh, for duration and the strength of the uv light uh, and then you know with lab testing afterward to see if the covid is gone you know 100% reliably and then they published that protocol and they're using that they have this uh, uv sterilization room that was created so that they have marks where they have the proper strength of uv light reaching to the mask in a certain circle pattern and you know all that was shared to the provider so that we don't have any anxieties about reusing those masks and it was also published for other people to be used uh, other institution and i i have seen some debates about uh, low prolonged heat based uh, sterilization but our center is using a uv based sterilization um, dr harikar is there any concept of reusing uh, masks or um, or equipment in pakistan in, you know in your hospital or or other hospitals well uh, yeah so the thing is that uh, we initially when this uh, covid started we as we practiced for tb we issued n95 for a period of 14 days with the indication that if it is obviously distorted or soiled then you need to change it otherwise please continue but with the the building up of you know shortages of pp then there are studies which are showing that evaporated hydrogen peroxide and uv light and dry heat may safely um decontaminate it uh even people are saying that alcohol spray uh, using it at a distance may do the same what we have uh, we've not tried these um, but uh, the thing is because i feel that they the alcohol spray destroys it but uh, what we do is use um, a surgical mask over it so that the life of the n95 and we protect it from getting directly contaminated thank you appreciate it uh you know to be honest i think the uv light setup is pretty cheap you know uvb bulbs are not that expensive and in 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 creating a setup especially in pakistan should should not be too hard uh if if in protocols are published that could be followed but that that's a good thought we have uv lights but the question arises for how long do you keep it under the uv light and at what distance you know if if your institution ever is interested i can share the university of nebraska's protocol but i'm sure there are other pro- protocol out there too Um, sure sure please do dr rosina are there other options for uh, disinfecting sterilizing equipment like ultrasound besides use of alcohol wipes that ever considered or discussed for the probe because the probe is the main part which comes in contact with the patient body so mm. you, if even if but i mean entire machine you can you have to clean it standard is the one which i already told you but in case it's situation like if you you can just make a soap and wash your probe if it is not any damage because then you can cause the uh, electric shock stuff you know so if it's not a mess it is intact so you can just wipe it with the soap and then wipe it with the plain water so it will be uh, enough Uh, but if your alcohol wipes and wipes and products wipes on the table, yes, please, those are the standard one. But in situations we don't have something, then this this is better. Thank you, Doctor Sosi. If you have a comment, please go ahead and mute yourself. Okay, I read somewhere that they are experimenting on ultraviolet rays, not ultraviolet A or B, but they are C rays, which have got shorter penetration. but they do not penetrate the skin or at least they will just penetrate the most superficial layer but they have a great capability to destroy the virus and they are experimenting to use it in public places maybe hospitals in this and it is just in the experimental stage but they have found good results with uv c rays so maybe we'll hear more about it in future thank you thank you um So another question we have Dr. Rosina is about um uh you know the, you were talking about the doffing of the device and donning and doffing is is that something you do before entering the room or inside the room or how do you uh, save time and be efficient with with these processes So obviously when you before entering the room you make your machine covered with the necessary stuff you know uh if nothing then at least cover those parts the exposed parts with the linen and the transparent uh, panel with the uh, 
because you are touching the protein, uh, the nostril, it will be gone. But it should be done before entering the patient. And the doffing is done, obviously, in the patient room and then dispose it off, but clean it. And then once you according to your uh, policy of your institute that how you have to do your own doffing. So once you're outside the patient room, then you have to clean it once again before you keep it at the designated area. So this is the something which we came out of discussion with other people including directly in the COVID-19 unit, that this is the best protocol to apply. But I, as I said, that it is not the only the it is not the only way. More and more uh, changes and options, it's, it's always welcome and uh, everybody can apply whatever. But the main purpose is to protect the patient, to protect the operator, and to protect the other colleagues also. Uh, thank you. And are there any technical challenges of using the equipment afterwards, uh, such as you know, having any air in the probe, shield cover, uh, or reducing the quality of the results from a probe? Uh, mm. No, care. if you are using the uh, probe cover, so then obviously you have to put a uh, gel inside the probe cover. And then if there is any uh, bubble in the that part, so you can just wipe it because there are some ways how to reduce the, the gel and the probe cover. It is that you just put a finger on the probe and it's gone. So usually there is not any such thing which may uh, affect the uh, resolution or the quality of the image uh, when you are scanning with the with the probe. Uh, even with the, I have scanned it also with the glove to see how is the resolution. Very good, thank you. And um, so you know one of the things that have been asked before is is, is general questions about. Uh, written protocols or SOPs to follow for disinfection. Is that something you also have a written protocol or SOP for for the equipment uh, that uh, that you can suggest or share? Yes, the, uh, that is the, like we are using it, the Clorex is must, that we must uh, completely entirely clean the machine with the Clorex wipes. This is the, our standard. And they have provided two types of uh, um, uh, like the sanit wipes and the Clorox wipes. So Clorox wipes is especially for the contact with the patient body. So part of the cable, we do that. So this is the uh, standard for our uh, institute. Uh, plus we also have some of these uh, uh, handheld devices. So the handheld device has a very good thing because we put the whole device in a small sheet and then we doff it up before we come out of the room. So uh, that's what we are finding in our institute. Very good, thank you so much. Um, you know, there have been uh, similar questions in the past and I wanna go ahead and involve the panelists uh, with some of these questions about uh, disinfection in general. So I think one challenge have been that there are still some clinics, uh, many clinics in Pakistan who are seeing patients in, in uh, trying to figure out how to minimize those risks. Uh, are, uh, can they use some of these disinfection techniques in between the patients or patient waiting area? There have also been questions about uh, personal uh, tools that you may use or may walk into the patient's room like keys, mobile, or things like that. So any suggestions about disinfection in general? Um, let me start with you, Dr. Kaleem. Well, I think uh, we have covered this uh, many times. The minimum is the best. The, the least amount of equipment uh, you want to take with you in a proven patient who has COVID, that's the best practice. Now, um, as far as uh, seeing patient in your outpatient practice and when you are dealing with somebody who may be infected with COVID, but you're not sure. I think in that kind of scenario, uh, what we are doing is we are asking everybody who is coming to the office uh, certain questions prior to the coming to the office, which is, are you having those kind of common symptoms which is associated with COVID? And if they have those symptoms, we discourage them not to come to the office. And if the patient uh, is in the office, then we usually ask the patient to uh, you know, bring their own mask. If not, then we put the mask on the patient. And every member of our 
office staff, including the providers, are wearing the mask, and uh, hand sanitizer is readily available. And we try to avoid examining the throat of the patient, and uh, if possible, and try to keep a distance uh, similar to what has been advocated uh, about six feet or so. And uh, is to, is, uh, spending less amount of time uh, with in physical contact with the patient. So these are the primary precaution which we are taking. I'm not sure how best uh, our provider is in different setting in Pakistan. It's not a um, one a solution fit all because there are providers who are working in a very suboptimum environment. So I think uh, they should use the this common practice guideline and utilize this, improvise it into their own setting that what is possible and what is not possible. Thank you. Let me bring this question to Dr. Harikar and also add um, to this question about challenges of uh, inpatient management in the hospitals in general, uh, the challenges about um, taking care of patients on the COVID floor and then on the non-COVID floor, having other patients admitted who are asymptomatic uh, or may not have any issues, how you separate the care so that there is no transfer or getting or catching the infection while in the hospital, in the emergency room. And is the Indus Hospital have any specific guidelines for their outpatient clinics that they have many? Dr. Harik. Uh, I think we uh, lost Dr. Harikar. So we'll get back to her if she joins again. Uh, Dr. Kabani, you have comments on this? Yes. Uh, you know, I, in, uh, I was going to add in the, the something to what Dr. Kaleem said. Uh, everything that he said is definitely um, er, right uh, in order. In addition to that, uh, one suggestion that uh, that I would make, if, the, if you're not able to do teleconsults, we've talked about that many times too, and that is not a, a feasible thing, then at least one thing that can be done is to stagger the patients. Like when they're coming to the waiting room, they, come, they not everybody comes together and uh, space them out in the waiting room. And then, of course, you know, uh, clean the room every time in between patients uh, with, with the common solutions that we've talked about, the sodium hypochloride or 60% alcohol. Uh, so... Um, that's that, that's the only addition I would have. As far as the in-hospital uh, patients are concerned, I think from what I recall from Dr. Harikar's previous statements is that they have a, a COVID, they, they do, they have COVID positive patients in the hospital and the ones that are PUI patients in the investigation are in a different location um, close by. But uh, what I have seen at our hospitals here is that they are, they have, COVID uh, patients are all cohorted in one area. And those patients, they are communicating mainly by eye consult, which is a little app on your phone. And a lot of the conversation, interaction with the doctors, even with us from telemedicine, we are able to communicate with those patients by eye consult while we are in our, in our uh, communication center. And uh, the other a uh, thing that I have, uh, you know, that most hospitals have done is that they have created a COVID team and a non-COVID team, so sort of a backup team. So the non-COVID patients are being seen by a separate set of physicians compared to the to the COVID team, provided, of course, you have enough staff to do that. So there's, I mean, as uh, I'm sure there is some interchange of staffs. Thank you, Dr. Kavani. I want to uh, uh, also share that at the University of Nebraska neurology service that we run, we've also tried for doing video consults or eye consults uh, for as many patients as we can so that residents don't have any unnecessary exposure uh, that may not be required. Uh, and we are looking at having separate COVID service uh, for, for a more limited staff. So uh, great points. So let me uh, also get comments from Dr. Morton about uh, uh, the limitations of exposure and also visiting rules or regulations of uh, going to the hospital in general, Dr. Morton. Yeah, 
we are trying to limit the number of people that are entering and leaving the patient room. Medical students are no longer allowed in the hospital. Residents are limited in uh, taking care of non-COVID patients. We're trying to limit their exposure to COVID. And it, we are not sure how it's going to affect uh, their training in the long run, but uh, we are trying not to give COVID positive patient to medical student, to the residents. They're seen by attendings only. And we are trying to limit the number of people that are going in and out of the um, patient's room. We have COVID positive team, we have a COVID team and a non-COVID team. COVID, COVID team takes care of patients that have already been proven to have COVID positive test or they're suspected to have COVID based on patient's clinical findings or chest x-ray or CT scan findings. We are using the CT scan quite often in people in order to see how much of the lung is involved. Very good. And, you know, in University of Nebraska, I want to add that we have a strict no visitor policy for all patients, not just COVID patient, but any patient in the hospital is admitted for whatever reason. Uh, visitors are not allowed. And there are certain very few exceptions and there are some case to case exception that are given, but it has to be uh, reviewed by a specific team uh, who is assigned to allow that exception for that person to visit a patient ad admitted to the hospital. So the patients are just by themselves and the nurses and the, there's just no visitors allowed uh, for, for University of Nebraska. Um, uh, very good. So let me go back to Dr. Rosina. And there was a question asked by one of the attendees about uh, heat-based uh, sterilization. Uh, and, you know, the, you know, we were trying to do that for mask, low heat, high heat. Uh, and the question is that our equipment heat tolerant is that can be an option for the equipment uh, for uh, using a low heat for, for uh, no, no, not, not the heat cannot be used for the ultrasound because, uh, the, uh, the transducer has a, uh, plastic, or uh, foot plastic, uh, so equipment or transducer. No. And uh, from the panelists, how about using heat for sterilization of masks, things like autoclave or any other heating equipment? Okay, nobody has an opinion on it. Um, let me uh, also ask this question shared by Dr. Noshin Zera about uh, name of the app that is being used for those eye consoles or video consoles. Um, uh, you know, at University of Nebraska Medical Center, we're using Zoom-based consultation, which is integrated into our electronic medical record Epic. Dr. Kabani, what's your experience? Uh, uh, it's called iConsult, and there is a, a link that I was just trying to find to share that I can share with you, with the, with the group uh, as soon as I find it. It's called I, like a small I, Consult. Very good. That'll be great if you can share with all sure, the sure. Uh, participants. And sure. I'll, I'll find it. <coughs> wonderful. Very good. Um, you know, we had a bunch of questions uh, in the past, but I was trying to focus mostly on questions that are related to disinfection and sterilization as our topic of the day. And I think I have covered pretty much, I was going through the list here, trying to see if there is anything else uh, left. Uh, we, you know, we have covered so many of the questions in the past and there are some questions still left about uh, the COVID infection in general. Uh, but I think uh, 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 in the interest of time, let's just stick with our topic today. And um, I think we can uh, uh, consider concluding here as we're hitting our uh, 9 p.m. as we have been on time here. So I will um, invite Dr. Zina Munir for any closing comments and introduction to her next talk that's coming up. Uh, and she can, I also invite you to share any uh, courses or that you're planning to do in Pakistan in future or workshop. And, uh, and you can also share the course that we're working together for the Upna Academy uh, on uh, use of ultrasound and, and point of care ultrasound. Dr. Rosina, please. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Danish. Uh, uh, from the, uh, for the next, first of all, I will talk about the next uh, talk. So in the next talk, we will be uh, talking about the how to scan. Uh, how, what, I mean, I'm going to talk, uh, make it very simple and easy for you guys uh, so that you can even practice at home just by looking at that video. 
just the basic of some of the very important knowledge. So I will talk about that all. So I will make my whole lecture very simple and easy so that you can follow that. And then I will also go with you the findings what we are looking at. And now for the uh, for future, you know, we are all working, me and Dr. Um, Danish and our whole team of Upnomeric, we are working on a um, complete course for the point of care ultrasound. Uh, we, there are different modules and uh, you can just, uh, we made it simple. You can just see those modules and then you can also answer a couple of questions and at the end of each module, and then you can practice. So this is our, uh, we are working on that uh, whole program uh, plan uh, for the Apna Academy. Uh, for Pakistan, because I, every year I used to go to Pakistan and then I perform my, uh, for the last two years I'm working on uh, a point of care, but before that I worked on the vascular and on the uh, very special exams on OB and all these exams in Pakistan. But for the last two years I'm working on the point of, uh, for the one and a half year. I'm working on the point of care ultrasound for mostly the ER doctors. So I have performed like CMH, Delhi Reading Hospital, CMH in Peshawar and Rawalpindi and uh, uh, Air Force Hospital, uh, uh, um, Capital CDA Hospital. So the responses were, and the Harvard Medical University, so responses were very, very good and everybody they like it very much. So hopefully if everything is good, then in November I have a plan again that I would go if the situations are good and I will have all some of the workshops over there too. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. Uh, let me see if any last comments from panelists, otherwise we can uh, uh, start closing it. Darish, I just uh, um, want to again emphasize, especially for Pakistan, um, the news which is coming, how things are and what kind of challenges, I would strongly advise all our healthcare professional to please guide their family, friends, relative, anybody who has influence over. Please use the minimum. When you go out, please use the mask, minimum, and then wash your hand. If we do this practice, even when we going to slowly open up the society, I think we'll give a better chance for us to protect our population from spreading this virus. Uh, rest is going to be good when things are going to be go bad, but I think prevention should be our primary objective. Dr. Sohev, you have a comment? Uh, just, uh, sir, I want to have a a question and a comment and that uh, to the madam and you, to yours to you also uh, so, uh, nishtar is a very is one of the important hospital public hospital of the pakistan with a very good, uh, great number of patients you, when you, whenever you people come to pakistan do consider to come nishtar uh, it will be an honor for me to uh, facilitate and arrange uh, the talk of uh, uh, for any for uh, for this uh, for this and in future also thank you sir definitely i enjoyed my trip to multan thank you for hosting us and send me a message and i'll connect you dr rosina maybe we can convince her to visit, okay. visit multan thank in you. the city of shrines very yes. good thank you i think we'll call it a day and we'll finish uh, almost on time uh, much earlier than our usual day uh, it was having it was a pleasure having dr rosina and all the panelists um, and you will get, uh, I see the message posted by Dr. Kabani on the iConsult. So look at the chat box. The iConsult app has been posted by Dr. Kabani. Thank you so much. We'll also add it to our resources and we'll send that list as a post meeting email and we will share um, um, all of this on YouTube recording and we'll follow up with our webinar tomorrow. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you.